we've heard from time, time and time again from tribal leaders that um, uh, we, we, do, um, we do value the, the future, and the future is really, really um, wise with, with their children, and, and they are the greatest resource. Um, and so the, the, the only thing that I want to say is that um, we know that we've, we've made some progress, we've made a lot of progress, but at the same time that um, we know things out there aren't perfect. And that um, sometimes it seems like it's a, a really um, insurmountable obstacles that everybody has to deal with. Um, there's there's a, a big gap between the vision and the reality of, of what you want to achieve in your communities. Um, but with the Obama administration, we have seen a difference, and um, we have we've tried to maintain a consistency in how we deal and how we work and how we. Um, address the issues in any country. And we, we know that um, um, so many of the barriers have been removed, but we know there's many, many more that are out there. And that um, the only way that we can do this is when tribal leaders are sitting at the table and, and guiding us in, in how we address them. Um, we have uh, a great understanding of knowing that it's not enough. And, and I've said this, I think, probably too many times that the, my, my greatest reminder, my greatest, um, I guess, reality check is my own family. Because they're like, it's not enough. <laughs> it's, it's really not enough yet. So that, my motivation, and I know that it's a lot of people's motivation, of um, our work is not finished. And uh, our goals are, are still out there. We're, we're moving closer, but we're not quite there. And the only thing that um, we can we can do is um, is keep trying and, and never give up on, on reaching some of those goals. There's there's nothing wrong with having the vision of healthy, prosperous communities. And partnership with you, partnership with uh, the new secretary Jewel. She's going to be um, joining you on Thursday. Um, she is very committed to working on policy priorities that work by any country. And I, I just want to say that um, we continue to listen to your concerns and we continue to, to want to work in partnership with you. Um, as the president said at, the, um, um, at, a, at an address, he, he just wanted you to understand that you have an administration that understands the challenges that you face, and more importantly, that you have a president that's got your back. And we promise to continue um, with that commitment and in pushing your policy priorities forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have a, a question, Jody, just uh, one question. Authority 
that OMD has or the President's office has, uh, seems like uh, not consultation in line with the President's policy on consultation. And so uh, my, my uh, uh, request is that, uh, that the President uh, take ownership of this issue and find other funds to pay for the decision of the Supreme Court. When you really look at the amount of money that is in the contract support relative to the entire budget, uh, it really is not very large. But we spend more time uh, in, in past years and going forward uh, going through the court system, going through having lobbyists taken into Congress, uh, and on and on. When it's not a fact, what we're asking for is what the government owes us to manage this program. So my request is, is we can't take it back uh, to the president, and, and the OMB is going to say, well, gee, we can't do that. We put forth the budget to Congress already. Well, it happens every year when they put forth these budgets, they put it into embargo, and then the, there are adjustments made uh, by the president, the OMB, and et cetera, and then they will once again announce it in December. So that's my request, that if we can't take it back to the upper level where the decisions were made, uh, because I don't believe that uh, no matter what uh, the uh, Assistant Secretary bless his heart is going to try his best, but no matter what happens at that level, I don't think it's going to make any difference. It's going to have to, have to happen at an upper level if anything is going to be done that is positive to the tribes who are contracting. And contracting at a deficit under the current uh, uh, policies of the OMB and uh, some of the agencies. Take that back, and I just want to thank you for um, you, all of the work that you've done on this issue. There's parts of this that I probably can't comment on because you mentioned some of the settlement, but um, I, I do want to say that the, the leadership of um, Secretary Washburn and Director Rubido have um, have a great weight in the things that the president hears about and what he thinks about. And so, um, whatever tribal leaders say to them is going to be really important. Um, so I, I encourage you to, to, like I've been saying in my whole speech, that this, this partnership is, is important and, um, and they're both going to be working with tribal leaders. And it's, it's going to be a short time period that we're going to, you know, the budget start getting baked again. And so so we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to figure out something here. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ed. I just have one thing to add. The Supreme Court shouldn't have to tell the federal government to pay to do pay for the tribal government. Okay, well, thank you, Jody. Uh, now, I want to, you to help me welcome to the, to the podium uh, a person who, uh, a man who's going to give us an update on the Department of Justice, uh, Mr. Sam Hirsch. Mr. Hirsch has served as Deputy Associate Attorney General since March 2009. His main responsibilities at the Justice Department involve working with Environment, the Natural Resources Division, the Civil Rights Division, the Access to Justice Initiative, and the Office of Tribal Justice. Currently, uh, Sam Hirsch is spearheading the department's effort to implement the Tribal Pilot Project under the Violence Against Women Act of 2013. Please join me in welcoming Sam Hirsch. so far every day. 
in uh, seven days a week. It, it's just remarkable and inspirational. I also have to say I'm just thrilled that we now have Kevin Washburn as Assistant Secretary for Native Affairs uh, to have someone that brilliant and that grounded and dedicated. Um, it's just a true blessing. So it's wonderful that we are now getting the opportunity to work uh, with Kevin. We at the Justice Department are working very hard on a broad range of issues special focus on public safety and law enforcement in the country. Um, I do want to uh, talk with you a little bit about um, the report that we put out about a month ago. It's our first of what will be an annual series of reports called the Indian Country Investigations and Prosecutions Reports. And we went back and found, uh, a, it's, it's a very heavily statistical report. There's a lot of interesting data in there. I encourage you to look at it on our website. We went back all the way to 2009. And at, that, at that time, we filed about just over 1,000, 1,000 criminal cases uh, based in Indian country uh, in federal courts. And that number from 2009, 2010, 11, 12 went up every single year. And in the last year that we're reporting on, the most recent full year, uh, 2012, that number went from a little over 1,000 to 1,677. That's a 54% increase in just three years. And uh, we have a lot more work to do, but I, I have to say that uh, we're, we're very proud to see a 54% increase in three years. You don't often see numbers move that dramatically uh, when you're talking about large statistical and like numbers of cases filed. Um, it seems to us that there's at least three key explanations for this, which I think can be characterized as collaboration, prioritization, and resources. As for collaboration, back in January 2010, Deputy Attorney General uh, put out a memo to all U.S. attorneys in the tribes and their districts, directing them to consult annually with tribes and their districts in order to put together operational plans for how they would better combat crime in Indian country within their district. And this has led to an unprecedented level of collaboration between federal and tribal law enforcement and prosecutors and courts as well um, that has uh, just we think been enormously beneficial uh, to everyone involved. The second thing is prioritization of the uh, Deputy Attorney General ordered them to put the highest priority on controlling crime in the country, and specifically prosecuting crimes committed against Indian women and children. So it wasn't just collaboration, it was collaboration and prioritization. And the third point was resources. In the early years of the administration, we were able to add almost 30 new assistant U.S. attorneys uh, in the country, and those three things in combination have made a real difference on the ground. But of course, the, the most important player in, in all things in the Indian country are in tribal governments, and where, where we most uh, intersect with tribal governments is in providing tribal grants uh, through our grant making components, the Office of Violence Against Women, the Office of Justice Programs, and the Tribes Office, and the Indian Service and Services And starting in 2010, we uh, developed, based on consultation, a new system we call CTAS, or Native Tribal Assistance Solicitation, uh, which encourages tribes to take sort of comprehensive and holistic look at all their public safety needs, and also allows them through a streamlined process to file just one application for grants rather than multiple applications. There's been um, good things and bad things about this, but every year we feel like we listen to the tribes and try to adjust the program and make it better and better. And uh, just this year, for example, we um, tried to uh, try a suggestion move forward to December, the uh, point in the funding cycle when they begin the uh, solicitation and acceptance of applications. So under this program over the last three years, we have uh, uh, had more than a third of a billion dollars in CTAS grants going out to more than 150 tribes. And we feel the results uh, really start to bear fruit in the country. Our work is not limited, however, to public safety and law enforcement. We also have obviously tremendous responsibilities as to tribal resources. When this administration came in in 2009, I think one of the most progressive things for the federal tribal relationship was the long pending lawsuits over the federal government's mismanagement of tribal funds and Indian funds. And resources. As you all know, we settled uh, the group of court in Congress, the Cobell litigation, $3.4 billion, and the payments went out to around 400,000 individual Indians as a result of that. And we also turned our attention to the tribe.
vital trust cases, which have showed about 100. At this point, we've now settled more than 75 of those for a total of more than $1.8 million. And I can tell you today, we continue to work one-on-one uh, -on -one with tribes who uh, are involved in litigation to see if we can't settle more of those in a way that's usually uh, productive. I, I want to finish by talking to you just briefly about something that, as this administration gets deeper and deeper into the second term, we increasingly think about, which is sometimes call it, and maybe this is a word for too many syllables, but it, we call it our institutionalization uh, effort. The idea being that um, we want to make sure that whatever gains we've been able to make uh, over the last several years and over the next few years uh, cannot be eroded away by future changes in personnel or administration that might come in, in the years uh, ahead of us. Uh, it would be a shame if things we haven't been able to accomplish uh, don't last for the next 5, 10, 20 years. And um, let me give you three examples that I've been talking about. One is we took our office of tribal justice and made a permanent component of the Department of Justice and uh, made the director's position an SES position, a senior executive service. That's basically the highest uh, career posting you can have in the federal government. Uh, second example, a terrific one, is we instituted uh, the Attorney General's Tribal Nations Leadership Council. This is a group of 12 tribal leaders uh, from the 12 regions uh, who self-elected, uh, choose to come for the uh, uh, department times a year, meet the Attorney General and all the senior management offices of the department. And also get on conference calls every month and talk with Justice Department what we're doing and give us advice, give us ideas, give us suggestions on new things we need to be looking at, new problems we need to fix. And we've gotten this uh, uh, cycle where we talk every month, meet every six months, including with the Attorney General, now multiple times since 2010 when it first started. And I think the TNLC has really hit its stride. We really look to it for key advice on uh, all matters affecting Indian country. But the third example, which I don't think has been publicized at all prior to today, uh, is a purely internal thing. But again, it's a case of sort of institutionalizing something for the long run. And that's something we call the Indian Civil Litigation and Policy Working Group. And what it is, is it's, a, it's a group that gets together once a month. And uh, they come from the, the sort of non-criminal side of the department, from the civil side. Uh, almost all the litigating divisions, the Environment Division, Civil Rights Division, Tax Division, the Civil Division, the Office of the Solicitor General. We also have U.S. Attorneys uh, in the working group, as well as the Office of the Council, Office of the Policy, and of course, is co-chair of the Office of Tribal Justice. We all get together with the leadership offices, representatives of the AG, and Deputy AG, and Associate AG, and talk about what we are each doing in Indian country. And look, what there is is a lot of uh, Indian law expertise in the department, but it's sprinkled and spread. And this is a chance to get everybody in the room together once a month and educate each other about what we're doing and what we, what we can do to do better. Um, and this kind of coordination between components, it may sound kind of bureaucratic and dull, but it's actually very important to make things uh, function better in a huge department of government that's over 110,000 employees. So these three things are all, uh, we can already see uh, reaping benefits today, but also think about the future. If five years from now, some other administration decides they <coughs> don't want to have the Office of Tribal Justice or don't want to have an SES director, or they want to stop meeting with the Tribal Nations Leadership Council, or they want to disband this Indian Civil Litigation and Policy Working Group that's been meeting every month for years now. That's not so easy. Those are hard things to reverse. And, and we think that what this is about is taking progress that we've been working hard to make and baking it into the culture of the Department of Justice. These are not um, fads. These are not initiatives that come and go. These are not temporary demonstration projects. These are permanent features, permanent structures of the department. And this is a model that you can work with other federal agencies. You may think about uh, whether, whether similar things can be done there. Um, but by, by having sort of permanent institutionalized uh, settings to give high priority to Indian country, I think we ensure that in the out years, things will work uh, even better. Of course, the ultimate form of institutionalization is not uh, shifting things around within the federal government. It's shifting power and resources to tribal governments. 
And really, I think that's what VAL 2013, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act 2013 is all about. Congress recognizing and affirming tribes' inherent sovereign power to investigate, prosecute, convict, and sentence all perpetrators of domestic violence, regardless of whether they're Indian or not Indian. That's really the kind of shift that we think is uh, going to be most irreversible and most beneficial. And when we were involved in our legislative debates with you on the Hill, we heard a lot of abstract arguments about you know, different perceived problems with the bill, all of which were kind of up in the clouds and, and very abstract and, and hard to sink your teeth into. And it seems to us that the best answer to those will not be to answer abstraction with abstraction, but to answer with concrete success on the ground. When tribes start successfully prosecuting abusers and holding them accountable, then I think we're going to have real and permanent progress. And that's why we're so excited about implementing the Battle Pilot Project, which we're working on right now. The whole point of that pilot project is to encourage the development of best practices by the tribes. Whether it's how best to exercise its jurisdiction, how best to combat domestic <coughs> violence, how best to protect the rights of defendants, and most importantly, let's not forget, how to attend to the needs and rights of victims, of Indian mothers and sisters and daughters who too long have been neglected in this process. This is really what the pilot project is about. And we designed it and structured it now in a way that's not your typical top-down, Washington, D.C. focused pilot, but rather something that is in all its depth, it's intertribal, not just tribal, but intertribal. We are launching something called the Intertribal Technical Assistance Working Group for Special Domestic Violence Criminal Jurisdiction. And what that is going to be, is going to be tribal officials and employees sharing their views and information and advice peer to peer. That's really what the, the, the battle of how the project is all about. And I, I wonder how many of you, when you hear that, that sounds familiar, because to me, that's what NCAI is all about. For more than two-thirds of a century, it's been tribal officials and employees sharing views and information and advice peer to peer, lifting each other up, pushing each other forward. And anyone that's spent any amount of time in the Indian we all have, obviously, knows how successful that effort by NCAI all of its members has been over the long course of many decades. So with that, I just want to close by saluting you, by saluting NCAI, by saluting NCAI's members for everything you've done over those many decades, everything you've done in the last four years during this administration, everything you're doing today and this week at this mid-year conference, everything you're going to do in the future. Uh, it is truly remarkable. It's an American success story. And you should all know that the Attorney General, Eric Holder, the Deputy Attorney General, Jim Cole, my boss, Tony West, the Associate Attorney General, and all of these folks, you have true allies and real friends who respect and admire you for my better expressing words. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know that Sam will be around uh, this week to take questions and uh, visit with you. We're going to move on. Uh, right now, we're, we're way behind schedule. We have two more speakers to, to go before we get to lunch. And uh, so with all due respect, I'm going to go ahead and move on with our agenda. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Troy I. <coughs> Troy I serves as the chair of the Indian Law and Order Commission. Is it was the U.S. Attorney for the District of Colorado from uh, 2006 to 2009 and, and is a shareholder in the D Denver office of the international law firm Greenberg Turing LLP where he co-chairs the American Indian Law Practice Group. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Denver College of Law and University of Colorado Law School. Um, I, I want to say also that I've worked with uh, Mr. Ida on the, the last couple of years on the Indian Law and Order Commission and I can, I can tell you that he is uh, truly dedicated to uh, the Law and Order Commission and its work. And uh, we elected him uh, quickly as, as soon as we, we were able to get together in Santa Fe, New Mexico, 
Uh, because we recognize all of them. They go that way. How well he could work oh, there with Indian countries and for Indian countries. So please help me welcome to the stage, Mr. Troy Iyer. Thank you, Commissioner, Governor, President. We have a great distinction. And thank you so much for the chance to be here. I want to thank Juana and Terry as well, and everyone on the board, all the officers. I just want to say to you that it's, it's exciting that Bible passed, and it's exciting to see GLOA be implemented, but really my message to you is that all is not well in Indian country. And I'm going to talk a bit about what our commission is doing and, and the work that we are releasing to the public this fall. There are nine of us that were appointed by the President and Congress back in late 2010, early 2011. And our mission is to look at how TLOA, and now VAWA, because we're extended by the VAWA legislation itself, is being implemented. And then also look beyond the horizon to see what do we need to do to close the public safety gap. How can we get there together? And so we have spent now we have nearly two years out of the field. I've never had an officer in the and I field. did report it to We've Tracy to the hearing testimony and Tracy to the never did nothing. And, and Judge, Judge it has been an amazing journey. It's been a very spiritual road for all of us. Wallace, tried. And we're and about to release our findings this fall. We'll go into congressional oversight. I appreciate so much the same That's right, we're in there. That's the housing, that's government housing that's being and restored, and trees and, and everything. I have only prayed why you guys aren't doing nothing about it. You had a perfect speech up there about law and how you, how you quote unquote, really are looking for the first department, the first department while we have the FBI, the FBI, the CIA, but, the system that we live in you can think of in Pine Ridge and not take with the are ever doing anything about it. And so, my name, my background. It's not just like a shift a of power a little bit bit tribes. The one that you massacred World War I, World War II. It's going to be tribes and people who are free to do. What did you today, I have a lot of people who are part of the Indian community. I'm a sister for Willamaka, a sister judge. And in Winnemucca, they have seven tribes that are part of the Indian community. And in Winnemucca, they have seven tribes that are part of the Indian community. Well, we and they go. have a guy selling drugs. Every day is a good day in the about it. Not the FBI, you know, the CIA, the FBI FBI cops, nobody. None of you guys are good. You have a good, good speech. It's a good day. That gold it's a very good day right there. to be alive. We killed Custer. And I appreciate that the chance was never supposed to be replicated. All of us. And that I know everybody is right there means and that it's so we need to just see. let the system and I don't know why work, we're not through speculation, not through federal. We have to please do this for that. How can we actually get there to the tribes and simply assert what they need to do? And this is who we are. We deserve to be the people. Just in the last few months. You know, it's not right when you're going to have a supervisor. You ignored me. Why did you do that? Why did you do that to me? I'm going to be called grassroots. My family, they died so you guys can have freedom. That was very rude for you to do that to me. Thank you. To get a police report so you can do a case. How do you assert your inherent tribal criminal jurisdiction as recognized now by Congress? The one context, and I hope and pray many others. How do you assert that when you can't get your data? It's your data, by the way. It's not their data, it's your data. How do you assert that? Or in Hopi, where I've been privileged to see Chairman Chu, why tomorrow? his leadership, and his team. Why are they supposed to file a FOIA request to get police dispatch reports on 911 calls? They have a tribal law. They did exactly what Congress said under the Tribal Law and Order Act. Let's change our laws. We can enhance sentencing. We can run our own show, as they should. Why do they have to ask for permission to get this information? The tribal prosecutor, brilliant person, Bill Engel, just wants to do a case. She just wants to assert her right, the sovereign right, as delegated from the tribe to, to enforce their laws. Why, why, are, why are we in this asking permission mode? What is that all about? Why is this a new hope in Star Wars movies, or one, followed by the Emperor of Strikes Back? What is that? Why do we have to go through these hoops? For Rosebud, how could it be that when the tribe develops its own detention center, it's great. They have high school for detainees because the tribe values education for its young people. But in our system, for four of the last five years, the federal government, everybody's complicit in this, 
The federal government does not budget high school education for young people behind bars. They don't get high school. You realize we have Native people sitting in detention centers. And unfortunately, I've seen a lot of them. They don't have anything to do. They don't have any school to go to because the federal government does not see fit to fund high school education. Yeah. Which are oh, yeah. What a difference between what a tribe does. We don't have much money in Rosebud. But we're going to make sure our young people are educated versus the federal government. We have a trust responsibility. Well, we didn't get around to appropriating the money for your young people this year, or the year after, or the year after. And that's before this question, by the way. Me too. Thank you. But what do you do with our brothers and sisters in Alaska? What do you say when you're on a bush plane and a young woman takes your arm and says, Troy, they will not believe this. You have to stop. It's not just that some of us are raped. All of us are raped. Every woman you met today, and they came by snow machine and dog sled. And you know, a lot of people up there don't have enough to eat. Because milk costs 16 bucks a gallon up there if you can get it. What do you say to a person who says, all of us have been raped? And you know, Troy, there's not one shelter for any woman in the entire Yukon River Basin, hundreds and hundreds of miles. There's not one place a woman can go for protection. And well, maybe the colonial state of Alaska will send somebody once in a while. And I say that as someone whose family's from a colonial system and saw colonialism and recognized it instantly in Alaska and has been told over and over, Troy, please don't use that word in public. We're not colonial. It's colonial, folks. You can't rule people from afar, not recognize their rights. Tell them they, they can't have tribal courts to enforce their orders. You can't expect an unarmed police officer by his or herself who has no backup to be able to, to function in that environment. That's that's our status quo in our United States of America today. And our brothers and sisters in Alaska are not in the bottle, as we all know. I was in a meeting, and I appreciate the congressional process. But I said my piece, and I was told, sure, we'll support VAWA as long as Alaska is not in it. As long as it applies to us, we'll support it for other states. You know, all is not well in Indian country, in PL280 country, in Alaska. That's it's right. not well. And so we have got to do better. We, have, we can't just think that we're on the right road without doing what we have to do next, which is to imagine a world just 10 years from now, when we celebrate the Indian Citizenship Act, imagine a world that's a real world where we don't have a gap in public safety, where it isn't just assumed that Native people get second-class rights because they happen to be Native and they have to live on their, their tribal homelands. I know we can do it. And I said I closed by talking about Kevin Washburn. When I was a U.S. attorney, thanks to the good graces of the Southern Ute tribe, and I see Howard Richards and other leaders there, you know, they've done such a great job. They had us uh, come and visit the U.S. attorneys who had Indian country. It's 2007, September. And we were talking about how to improve public safety down there. And I had the temerity to invite some guest speakers, including one Kevin Washburn, who was a professor, who had written this radical law review article that maybe tribal juries were trustworthy and could be fair in cases and could actually assume jurisdiction over non-Indians in criminal cases. He wrote that article. And you know, he, he not only spoke eloquently, but you know, he opened up his heart. He talked to all of us in an executive kind of setting, and there were about 25 United States attorneys. And when he left the room, after they beat up on him for a while, they turned to me and said, I hope that no U.S. Department of Justice funds were used for that because he was casting the imprimatur of the Department of Justice in disrepute of what he said about the fact that we, the federal government, can't handle the situation. Can't handle it. I'll never forget that from one of my colleagues. You know, I heard that from the U.S. Marshal from a different administration was in Alaska. Troy, you don't understand. You've just been out in the field listening to a few people. Give us another 10 years, we will handle this situation. Well, folks, 10 years in Alaska is an eternity right now. 25 years, these villages are going to be gone if we don't intervene. This is a national crisis. We can't expect people who don't have enough to eat. And they don't. A lot of them don't. Their subsistence lifestyles being driven out. They didn't have any salmon this last year in most of that, most of that place. We can't expect them to be able to endure out there if we don't recognize that justice should apply to every American person. That's the idea of our country. The country's been imperfect. I love the country. It's been imperfect. 
The idea is a great idea. So let's try to live the idea. And the idea is, let's close this public safety gap. Let's imagine a criminal justice system that's different. Now, I'm not supposed to say what we're going to recommend. But I'm going to say one thing, because Jefferson's here, Commissioner here. It's about juveniles, since I've talked to you in Portland about juveniles. You know, it's just not right when you see what's happened that in the federal system, two-thirds of all the young people in the federal system are Native American in criminal detention of the juveniles. Two-thirds of them. Sentenced as adults. Here where we are, in Reno or the rest of the country, the average, it's about 1% of all juveniles in the United States are sentenced as adults. We know that in the federal system for Natives, it's a third. One-third of those young people are sentenced as adults. Does that sound like a fair and equitable justice system? That they're so different that they all had to go adults? One thing I won't be surprised for you to see in this report is a very simple premise. No federal criminal jurisdiction, no federal criminal jurisdiction at all over Native American juveniles unless Indian tribes consent in writing in advance, period. None. None. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a parent. I trust that you, as parents, and, God, and grandparents, and godparents, and everything else, I trust that you can deal with your children. I don't need to know. I know you'll respect them. I know your ways. No one needs to say, you know, please, I'm going to certify that. It's ridiculous. Young people are our future. Who better to take care of them than those who are close to them, who care about them in their communities? And if, a, if the federal government wants to take some young person into the federal criminal justice system as a juvenile, where there is no diversion, there is no drug court, there is no wellness court, let alone some rehabilitative program based on a traditional native model, there's just none of that there. As I've been told, even though it's been since 1938, the federal criminal justice system was not designed for juveniles, right? Well, that's right. It's been since 1938, and Congress put them in there. Since they haven't got it right since 1938, let's pull them out. There's no reason for them to be there. The tribes have their own laws and want to implement that like other local governments do, like the city of Reno can do under Nevada law. You know, and the tribe wants to have diversion, the tribe wants to try to save these young people. Why the heck are they in federal jurisdiction? Other than the 1885 Major Crimes Act, which was not a good year for Native people, 1885. Why do we have this blind imitation of the past? Why don't we question the underlying assumption of the whole system, which is it was not designed for local justice. It did not trust people. It treated people as incompetents. Tribal sovereignty, self-determination, inconsistent with all that. So it's time to take that next step. Federal laws that tribes don't need, federal laws that are hurting people, tribes should be making these decisions. The states don't have to say, mother, may I? Why do, we, why do we expect that? So I, I want to thank you for the chance to be here. I want to thank all the commissioners who are here. Most of them are here. I want to close by uh, thanking uh, one who's not here who has helped us so much, Carol Goldberg, uh, many of you know from UCLA. I remember after we spent our time in Alaska, we were dog tired, we came back to Anchorage, we got in a cab. By then, the newspapers were talking about the fact we were there. There were stories in the papers in Fairbanks and Anchorage, and we were visiting. <laughs> And Carol and I were talking, we were tired, and we were talking about some of the things that we'd seen. The cab driver turned around, said, you don't understand us. You're those two people in the newspaper. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean? He said, you're the ones who came up here to tell us what to do. And you know, that night, I went home, I was reading an Eisenhower biography, the new one by Gene Edward Smith. And during the Little Rock School crisis, Orville Faubus, the governor of Arkansas, said the same thing to Eisenhower. He called up and said, what are you doing keeping these young African-American students? Well, we didn't use that term. <laughs> you know, what are you doing use keeping them out of school? How can you not let them matriculate? Fawbus said, you don't understand. You don't know us. You're not confident. And I'm just telling all of you, one thing I've learned in two and a half years, I may not be Native, I may be a Republican, I may be a former Bush appointee. I even am. <laughs> I'm not sure what flipping the house is going to do to me, folks, but, but one thing I have learned is that I am confident because anyone who can fog a mirror and tell the truth in this country about this injustice is confident, and I am putting my trust and my heart in you. Thank you.
I can see why we uh, elected him chair really quickly. Um, and I was responsible for that. He has let me forget, but, uh, but an uh, outstanding job. Thank you, Troy. By the way, I, I just had a, uh, some heavy bling brought to me, found in the lady's bathroom. Uh, it's, a, it's a ring. I know these are, are genuine diamonds. Uh, and it's, what was I doing? <laughs> I was looking for jewelry. <laughs> no, uh, Jackie just found this. It was brought to us. So if it's yours, come and, come and claim it. You got to describe it. No, you just come and claim it. Okay, now it's my, it's my honor and privilege to welcome to the, po uh, to the podium uh, one of my heroes, one of uh, a young man. Yeah. And I call him young man because he's a lot younger than I am. I've known him since he was a kid. He is a Chickasaw. Uh, he is doing an outstanding job. Uh, Kevin Washburn, the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, uh, former Dean of the uh, University of New Mexico Law School. People ask uh, Kevin uh, why he would take an offer or an invitation to become the Assistant Secretary you know, almost at the end of the first term, President Obama. And I believe, and he, he wouldn't answer that, but I believe it's because he I wanted to make a difference, and he is making a difference. Uh, please help me welcome a, a, a good Chickasaw citizen, the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, Kevin Washington. I pay him a lot of money for all those words, so I want you know. He knows my mom will yell at him. She, he sees my mom a lot, and she'll yell at him if he doesn't do that. So. You know, I have to tell you, I prepared a speech for today, and then I went out on my run this morning, I was thinking about it, and I got back from my run, and I learned about that baby girl case, and it just made me sick. And, um, it's always, you know, two or three steps forward and one step back in Indian country. It's just, it's, that's always the way it is. And um, I just, I, I I don't, want to, I don't want to focus on that because actually, as you've heard from this podium, from Troy Ide and Sam Hirsch and Jody Gillette and Mark Trahant, there's so much going on out there and there's so many ways to make a difference. But I have to talk about this for just a minute because it just it got me down and it's the topical thing. It's the most important thing that happened today. So much of our work, um, you know, I've been in this job for about nine months now um, with all of your support, thankfully. And um, so much of our work is defensive. It's just always trying to beat back stuff, um, bad stuff. And, um, you know, yesterday we had the, a consultation on the Patch Act patch, trying to address the Patch Act case in some small way. We can't completely fix it, but we can patch it with the Indian administration. We're trying to do that. You know, we're still trying to get a Kachiri fix. Um, we're trying to get that through Congress. We're working really hard on that. But it's just one thing after another. Um, with Supreme Court cases that are bad that have to be fixed. And we will turn now to baby girl. We got another, we got another issue um, that we are gonna have to um, address. Um, and this one's important. Um, land into trust is exceedingly important, but children, I dare say, are even more important than land into trust. And um, so this is something that we're gonna need to focus on pretty heavily. I will tell you, it's frustrating though. The South Carolina court ruled in favor of the Cherokee father. The South Carolina court, the state court, ruled in favor of the Cherokee father, and the federal court reversed them. What's wrong with this picture? That's not the way it's supposed to be. And actually, I've started focusing on these state courts and equip cases a lot more in the last few months. And um, I think because everybody's been focused on equip a lot more in the last few months. The state courts have been doing all right. Um, they've, by and large, been following ICWA. They've been, you know, they've been ruling for the tribes. They've been making sure that their courts follow the law with ICWA. And then we get this case that, to some degree, pulls the rug out from under all of us in this area. I will tell you, um, we, there has been some thinking going into this, even before this decision came down. Those of us that went to the oral argument, we're a little worried that it was going to go this way. And indeed, I think as Jackie said, it's not as bad as it could have been. They didn't declare the ICWA unconstitutional, which would have been mushroom cloud bad. I mean, it, they didn't do that. But they did, um, to some degree at least, uh, confirm the existence of this notion of an existing Indian family exception 
which we all had said for years is not in the statute. We've even got most of the state Supreme Courts to agree with us. Um, and so that's pretty frustrating. But um, we, um, we've, been, we've been looking at this, um, even after the oral argument that Jody Gillette called a meeting among a bunch of folks that, that are federal officials from the Department of Justice, Department of Health and Human Services, and Interior. And we all got together and started talking about how we're going to fix this. And Jody, she's um, a terrific drill sergeant. She had us in subcommittees by the end of the meeting. And so we've got, we, we're, we're moving forward. We're going to have to add another subcommittee or something like that. But we've got some things we can do, and we're going to try to do that. The law, um, you know, the Supreme Court has said something about the fundamental statute that we can't change. But we will work to try to get this law implemented better. We have BIA regulations, we have BIA guidelines, and those, deter that those need a fresh look, and we're going to do that. I was out in South Dakota with Chairman Brewer recently, and um, you know we can do some, we can make some improvements, I think, in ICWA. We need to. This is serious. This is our children, and so we have a lot of priorities. But this is a first-order priority. This is one of the most important kind of priorities that we can have, and we need to fix it. So. We, you know, the, the thing that gives me hope is that yesterday we were talking with the Justice Department about how do we um, fix, you know, how do we implement the VAWA pilot project. We had a first order problem when our women were being subjected to domestic violence and sexual assault, and we found little ways to start to address that, and big ways, actually. This is a really big um, way to address it, and so I'm confident that with all of your help and all of your hard work. I, I wish you were working on an affirmative agenda rather than a defensive one, but you all seem to get the job done when you focus on something. And um, I'm very grateful for the, the leadership of everyone on this stage and everyone in this audience because you work really hard and frankly, you do make a difference. You make a, a vast difference. I am, I, we had, we're out here. I haven't been traveling much um, recently. Um, I didn't go to NICA. I didn't. I haven't gone to most of the big conferences because sequestration. We're trying to save money. If I can stay home, it and it seems like it costs at least a thousand dollars every time I leave town, basically. And so, if I can stay home, it'll save us all some money. And I know all of you are feeling the pain of sequestration, so we haven't been traveling much. But what we have decided to do is we're, we're doing two consultations and associated with NCAI with Jackie's help and all the staff support. We're so grateful for that. And so we did the Patch Act Patch consultation yesterday, and we did, we're going to do the contract support cost consultation um, later today. Um, and I don't, uh, Mr. Thomas isn't um, um, certain that it's going to be all that fruitful, but we're going to do it. But one of the things that allows us to do is bring more staff to this conference, because this is a good place where we can meet with all of you. And I have a heck of a lot of staff here um, that are willing to do that. Um, and I'd ask them to stand up so everybody can see. But Deputy Assistant Secretary Larry Roberts, my new uh, Chief of Staff, Sarah Harris, has now been on for about two months, and she's terrific. She's from the Mohegan Tribe. Um, Larry is from Oneida, Wisconsin. Sequoia Sintermeyer, Deputy Chief of Staff, is also here. Um, Nedra Darling is all the way at the other end of the room. We've got both ends covered, um, our Public Affairs Specialist. And um, we have a new counselor that's here with us. Catherine Isom claus is with us. And I don't know, Catherine, I'm not sure where she's in the room. She might, oh, she's waving back. And uh, oh, Mike Black is, is here, and Vanessa Ray Hodge from the Sisters' Office as well. So we've got a lot of staff here to talk to you about important issues. And I want to thank that team, because this team has been really effective. While we've been doing a lot of defensive work lately, as I said, we've also been pushing a lot of things forward. And um, is Daryl here? Is Daryl LeCount still here? Yeah, that's Daryl, the big, big guy. How did I miss him? Um, Daryl LeCount's been working really hard on land into trust. And one of the great stories that we can we can say, oh, and Kelly Hamley is here too, um, one of our Schedule C presidential appointees who we don't often bring on the road to these kinds of meetings, but we're really lucky to have her here as well. Um, we've all been working really carefully. I'm not, I hate doing that because I always leave somebody out and I've, I've made somebody angry, but I want you all to know who to seek out, who to look up um, and whenever, if you need to meet with somebody to talk about issues. Because for all these nationwide issues, we've also got a bunch of individual issues. Each of you has um, issues that you need us to address. And I, you know, I, was, I, I joked that I knew there were going to be 566 different issues facing me when I got in the job. I didn't realize that every tribe was going to have five to seven different issues that they needed me to address. So it's been awfully overwhelming. Um, we are doing a lot in a bunch of different areas. And I'm so glad to tell you that um, Secretary Jewell will be here on Thursday. 
Um, she reached out early to tribes, and um, a few of the people on the stage here came to met with her her first week on the job. She did only internal meetings, only meetings with employees the first week on the job, but the one external group she wanted to see was tribal leaders. And so we um, asked about 10 or 15 tribal leaders, 10 to 12 tribal leaders, something like that, to come in and meet with her. And um, she's coming in Thursday um, to speak with all of you. And um, honestly, <laughs> I told her that attendance might sometimes a little bit lighter on Thursdays. You really want to be there on Tuesday? She said, I can't do it on Tuesday, but I really want to speak to this conference. I want to be at NCAI, my first opportunity. So this is her first opportunity. It's the first conference you all have had since she's been confirmed. And so she insisted on coming out. And so I hope that all of you, um, many of you, will be here for her. She was told it might be a little slightly more intimate group. Um, because I know some people have business they have to get back to um, and back at home. But she's got a pretty big announcement to make. And one of the things that we've kind of had trouble with, you know, it's a new day in, in Washington for Indian country because we've got tribal advisors in virtually every department. And, um, you know, Sam Hirsch talked about the Justice Department work groups that we've got going um, and um, the tribal leadership, uh, tribal nations leadership council, I think it's called. And um, we've got good things like that going on in virtually every department, but one of the things we still kind of have is silos. Um, I have to commend Sam Hirsch, because the Justice Department has been tremendous about reaching over to us, um, and we've been working a lot together, but there's still a lot of silos in Indian country, and um, um, Secretary Jewell is going to talk about some of the ways we're trying to address the silo issues that we face. So, um, I hope that a lot of you are here on Thursday to hear her. Let me tell you, she is listening. I think she's already a huge fan of Indian country. It was um, very moving when um, everybody, when, when the meeting that she had um, with some of these leaders. At that meeting, S. Thomas brought in some figures, and he said, "I'm, you know, I'm concerned about this. How come it's, there's other department parts of the Department of Interior that have gotten bigger increases in funding over the last 10 or 15 years than BIA has gotten?" And um, it hit home with her because she says she's not comfortable with that and she wants to she wanted to learn more about it um, as soon as um, Ed left and so you know she listens she's she's um, you know she hears what's what the, you know the problems are so I think we've got a real ally there and I will tell you this is the way it is and um, this is why this administration I think has been able to accomplish so much you have to educate educate people that are not you know unless they know Indian country already and she, Sally uh, Jewel has some experience but you have to educate people and this administration has a lot of people who came into the job already fairly educated. And I think that's the way um, they've been, uh, you know, this administration has been successful in, in many respects in moving so many things forward. The Justice Department is probably the best example of that. It's been absolutely terrific. Okay, so let me talk about, um, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the baby girl case. I, I, I think Mark Germont has a great idea. Um, and flip, flipping this house, we might also need to flip this court. Um, I think that, um, you know, it was a 5-4 decision, and if it was just flipped the other way, right, 4-5, I mean, it would have gone the other, the other way. And so um, I think that that's something that we need to think about. How do we, how do, we do that? How do we flip the court in addition to the house? Um, we're working on a lot of land in the trust. Restoring tribal homelands remains one of the administration's top priorities, and um, we are continuing to work on getting more land into trust. And um, Daryl LeCount is working really, really hard on that, Na nationally working with lots of different people to try to make that happen. We think the Patch Act patch, um, if everybody agrees that once we get it adopted, we'll make a difference in that as well, because it'll protect those lands that are taken into trust, make them a little more secure, and um, we'll plan a little bit more um, cert with certainty on developing those lands, and that'll make a big difference as well. We are also working on trying to develop bigger parcels, you know, looking for mandatory acquisition type situations where there's another federal agency that's giving up land that's within a reservation uh, or near a reservation and ensuring that the tribe um, gets a, a crack at that, a shot at that. Um, and also, we're just encouraging, you know, encouraging you all, if you've got parcels of land, you know, I hope you're filing um, land and trust applications for them. It's a slow process, it's sometimes a, a time consuming process, but it's restoring tribal homelands has to be one of our highest priorities and has to be um, something we focus on a lot. We also have been working really hard on the Cobell buyback implementation program. Um, 
$1.9 billion to try to solve the fractionated interest problem, and Chairman Robert Shepard is um, um, going to work with us. He's one of the first tribes, and Assistant Wapen is going to be one of the first tribes where we roll that out. Um, he's been um, chomping at the bit to get working on that. He's been bothering me um, almost weekly <laughs> about how do we get this started. Um, we made an announcement last week that we're kind of moving past the preparation into the implementation stage. And there will be this week here at the conference a work group on cooperative agreements because we know that this will only be successful if tribal leaders are pushing it. Um, you know, they're not going to listen to a bunch of suits from Washington. They're going to listen to their tribal leaders um, when those offers come out. And we need the tribal leaders really to take this on. And um, Chairman Shepard has been uh, very aggressively willing, enthusiastically willing to do that. So we're going to move out with this tribe and several others. We hope to um, develop cooperative agreements with um, five to ten tribes by the end of the year and really start spending some money, buying some fractionated interests. And that will be um, a really big um, event for Indian country if we can be successful because those are lands that presently no one really has control over because there's, you know, they've got you know, many nu numerous different owners and so no one has control over that land because you can't get enough of them together to make a decision about the land. As soon as we get at least 51% interest in the tribe, the tribe will have ownership and the tribe will be able to make decisions about that land and put it into use. And so that'll be a real big um, success. And frankly, it will restore, we've, we've taken about 206,000, uh, 208,000 acres into trust since the beginning, the beginning of the Obama administration. This has got potential to far exceed that. This $1.9 billion could restore a lot of land to tribes that's already within their reservation. Um, and you know, in short, it, it'll be a, an incredible increase in tribal sovereignty because there'll be a lot more land within the reservation that tribes will have ownership of if you all can be successful in getting these owners to sell, to sell the land to the tribe. So I really hope that you all help with that. We're doing um, some, we've got some new details that we are trying to um, get implemented. One of them is a, man, is a minimum purchase price of $75. You know, we know that some of these lands are, are, are they may not, Fractionated interests are so tiny, it may be worth $5 or $10 or something like that. And we're worried that people won't even sell. And some of them won't be for sale. That's well, right. Well, it's not for sale. Let me out, Chuck. told me I had the end. Well, and so we, we are. I'm a Lakota. We are going to. That government course. killed our people. We are going to buy as many of these interests back as we can to restore for them to tribal ownership. So the United Nations can, says uh, land is not here. for sale. So, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's, I that's have to daughter. stand up. Okay, now, land into trust is a very important um, priority for us. We really want to restore tribal homelands and tribes. Um, honoring our treaty commitments is another important aspect of our work. Um, the Obama administration has repeatedly emphasized that it wants to do that. That, frankly, doesn't um, often, it's not a bunch of work that affects every tribe nationwide, but we're working with many different tribes to help um, ensure that their individual treaty commitments, their fishing rights and that sort of thing are honored. And we're really trying to, um, we've, we've been bring, taking more cases over to the Justice Department and asking for affirmative litigation and that will make a difference for, for, for many of you. We're gonna to continue to try to settle Indian water disputes. That's another big administration priority. We've got a few that we're working on. We've had a bunch of success on that. In the first four years, the Obama administration had some real success, but we wanna continue that momentum going forward, even though fiscal times are tight, and these are very expensive. We also have to work on advancing Indian education, and I won't lie to you, Indian education is one of the biggest challenges that we have right now. We've got a wonderful acting director, Monty Russell, who's from Navajo, and um, he's been commuting to Washington, D.C. while we do a search for a new director for Indian education. Um, but we have a lot of work to do there, and it's important, too. It's another thing that directly affects children and directly affects our future, so it's something that we're giving a lot of attention to. Um, you will see the president today is making a speech about climate change, and. Um, you're gonna see an increasing focus. For those of you who are really suffering from climate change issues, and those have, you know, it's a lot of you, um, we've been seeing more flooding, we've been seeing you know, more heat in the deserts, we've been seeing more um, climatic incidents, um, storms and that sort of thing that are causing problems, tornadoes, and um, we need to really start taking this seriously, and the president's committed to doing that, and we need to find a way to make sure we're doing 
um, what we need to do for tribes on those issues. And some of the tribes are more vulnerable than others in those issues, but that's a really important um, part of our, our work. We are also um, working to try to figure out how to promote self-governance during ever tighter fiscal times, and that will remain um, a big priority, as well as providing uh, safe and healthy communities. And um, Chairman I talked about, you know, el much more eloquently than I can, about how serious it is to make sure our communities are safe. Again, a very a first order problem. It, economic development and all those things are exceedingly important, but we, we first have to have safe communities and safe, um, safe people. And so we are working on that, and I'm just um, so thrilled about the Justice Department's dramatic increase in prosecutions, um, because those are the kinds of things that really make a difference in Indian country. Now, one of the big things um, we rolled out Friday was our, um, our acknowledgement recognition regulations. And we had a work, I uh, met with the work group yesterday from NCAI on that issue. <coughs> And that's um, one that we're working on really hard. When I took the job, Secretary Salazar told me that that was something that needed to get done. We needed to look at our Part 83 regulations, which cover acknowledgement and recognition of petitioning groups. And um, honestly, I heard about it over and over when I was over um, during my confirmation process. Senators kept bringing it up with me. And frankly, former assistant secretaries, nearly every one of them said, that's something we should have done when we were in the job and we just didn't get it done. And it's not easy to get it done. It takes a lot of work. Um, it's hard to move any regulations very quickly. But um, I'm fortunate, my Deputy Assistant Secretary Larry Roberts has, has a real passion for this, and I've got a real interest in addressing it. And um, we've had work groups um, within the department working on that. We rolled out on Friday a discussion draft, and we will soon be holding tribal consultations around the country. <clears throat> in addition to tribal consultations, also public meetings, because petitioning groups are not tribes yet, um, and so they need a place to you know, get their, their concerns too, so we'll be um, seeking their input. We, um, um, within about the last two weeks, in addition to rolling out the proposed rule on the Patch Act patch, we also rolled out the final rule on the Bi Indian regulations, the Bi Indian Act regulations, and if you see Del Labrador, he was here earlier, if you see him, thank him, because that was work that was largely done um, before I got to the job. We just had to kind of squish it over the finish line, but all the real heavy lifting had already been done. And that's terrific, because it will ensure that the Department of Interior, when it lets contracts, is going to be going to Indian contractors um, for those contracts. And that's really important. <coughs> it's um, um, one of the small things that we can do, because we don't spend that much money, but it ensures that tribes have, Indian uh, contractors have the first crack at those, those types of things. So, those are some of the things that we are um, that we are working on. I know that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, and I want to leave a little bit of time for at least a, at least a couple of questions. Um, and let me just, just to tee up a little bit more for um, Secretary Jewell. Um, I, she's very excited about being here. She's already kind of inclined to be an advocate for Indian country, and um, I, you know, interacting with you is what can only increase that, and we need that kind of leadership at the top, because that really makes a difference. Um, when the secretary starts asking about the budget and why it's not for the tribes, that gets attention in a way that we're, you know, they expect me to say that kind of thing. I'm the assistant secretary for Indian affairs, and I speak to the table all the time and say that. But when the secretary starts to ask those kind of questions, it really makes a difference. So I, um, I encourage you to reach out to her, and um, I, I think you're going to find that she's going to be a real ally for you, and she's already started to become that. And um, she's really looking forward to spending time with you on Thursday. I won't be here because I've got to, I've been sent to Alaska, but um, but um, you all will be here, and I know you'll take really good care of her. So thanks so much for all the work that you do in Indian Country, and thanks for having me here. We, we have time for a couple of questions. He has agreed to, to stand by. Uh, when you have a question, I'm going to ask you to come to the, to the microphone, identify yourself and your tribe, um, be respectful of everyone else's time. Uh, if you're going to make a, a statement, uh, make it, and or if you have a question, ask the question. If it's going to be very lengthy, I would ask that you would just wait and, and uh, we can catch you in the hallway or or different time. Uh, 
I want to apologize to the young lady. I didn't mean to cut you off, but we were trying to move through here. So we'll get to your questions. Uh, I guess we have on the right here. Yes, ma'am. Just start talking. Can you hear me now? <laughs> My name is Gloria Simeon. I'm with the Woodland Southern Native Council, Pride, and Bethel, Alaska. It's really nice to see you, Assistant Secretary. I addressed you at the NAIHC. But um, there was not a question, but more of a request or plea not only to the Department of the Interior, but also to other departments that are in partnership with our, our, our tribes. In Alaska, we do have some, things are different with us. And it seems from what I, I see that the federal government and its departments sometimes pay more respect to regional organizations and to corporations and treat tribes like where the, the poor orphan children when we are the tribe and we should be recognized as being the first in that line. We give those organizations the authority to pass on our behalf. The other issue I have is that in my community of Babel, which is the largest Native community in Alaska, we have several very large, powerful regional organizations and corporations that have been given first dibs when federal land has been ceded. And I think that is grossly unfair to our tribe. That needs to be changed. We are a very poor tribe, or landless. But these are issues that are paramount to us and stand in the way of us standing on our own two feet while we're under the shadow of giants that are getting more and they're getting the tribe share. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take those things to heart. Uh, thank you, Mr. I'd like to first of all acknowledge the leadership of NJI, the vice president, president, and tribal leaders. I don't have a question, I just want to make a statement. I want to remind the audience today, 137 years ago, in the Battle of the Little Big Horn, the first major, major defeat of the United States Cavalry. 137 years ago, that happened today. Cheyenne, Northern Arapaho, and the many bands of the Lakotas uh, defeated George Custer. Remember that. That was 1876. In 1878, Chief Crazy Horse was learned to Fort Robinson. And while at Fort Robinson, Chief Crazy Horse was stabbed with the bay that he bled to death in an army barracks at Fort Robinson. Sometime early in the morning, his family came and took his body and buried it someplace where nobody knows. One of, the, one of the legacies of that time is that Chief Crazy Horse's mother made a song. The song is 138 years old. This song is sung this month at the Sundance Tree and brought it to our sacred uh, prayer. So today, I'm gonna to take a big risk and I'm gonna sing that song that his mother made 138 years ago. <clears throat> Hey, 
remember me. And this is what she prayed to or said as he left to go to the spirit world. This song is sung by us to give us courage and strength that that major battle was the last battle that we fought to preserve a way of life. However, the fight continues. All you tribal leaders in here, you continue to fight. So let's remember all of those who went before us that brought us here today and that we are still Indian. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia Firefender, for that honoring everybody um, um, and those who have gone before with that wonderful song. Um, let's start to, we've got now lines of both um, microphones, so let's go over here next. Yeah, Mark Romero, proud chairman for the Mesa Grand Band of Michigan. I just wanted to uh, make a comment on HICWA. You know, it's a shame the Supreme Court can't get it right, uh, but the state court did. Um, one of the things that uh, we face in California, or I have faced personally, is the definition of an Indian child. Uh, the definition is uh, a child that is enrolled or eligible for enrollment in a set of recognized tribe. Uh, but because of the uh, because of the um, uh, different criteria for enrollment, uh, and some tribes are changing it all the time, uh, it makes it difficult so some children aren't eligible for enrollment, even though we consider them uh, part of our tribal community. And my tribe has lost children because of that definition. We need to add into that language, uh, that definition, that is, if the community uh, acknowledges that child as a member of the community, uh, that it was should apply, uh, because I, I'm, I'm dealing with the case right now. And the child is going up for adoption, and we can't stop it. Uh, because the court, uh, some courts will go to the spirit of the law, some courts will go to the letter of the law. Uh, so we really need to add that in the definition of an Indian child. Uh, the problem with my tribe is the blood quantum. We've lowered it, you know, uh, to save our children, but personally I think we need to do away with blood quantum altogether anyway. That's what the Europeans established. Um, so, uh, if, if we can somehow work together to get that done, to get that uh, added to the definition of a child, uh, we'll save more of our children. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Robert? Thank you. Um, before I get started, I need to say this in the right way to all my grassroots relatives. Togaya Tugashila Wokula Waka. Lem Yechum told me him ye. Chuck Bell Piamatua. Relatives, before anything is said, I want to thank the Creator first. First and foremost, my name is Bear Woman. I am from Wondi I'm a descendant of the Little Big Horn. The one did he massacre? World War I, World War II, 1973, when AIM went against the federal government, my dad was a cop. He could have killed anybody. They gave him OK. The federal government did. My dad put that gun down, and he walked off of his job. Today, I and a law advocate for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, the Fallon Pike Shoshone Tribe. I'm assistant judge for Winnemucca Rudy James, and I am the Tetuan Treaty Second World Representative along with Clifford White Eyes and Garber Gitloon. The last three days I've had communications with the United Nations. Sir Eric I need to say his last name because I'm not from that side, but I'm going to let you know I've been sending videos to him. I sent approximately $2.64 billion of investment in Pine Ridge to him, but I also gave it to Tracy Tubu two years ago. There's two land documents in Pine Ridge, a 344N and a 344U. Land isn't for sale. The exile pipeline and neglected impeachments. We have the BIA, the FBI, the CIA, the police department, local, state, and federal. 
and nobody's doing nothing about it. That really hurts me. So before you decide to buy one in need or sell one in need, you take care of those problems in the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation first. I think that would only be fair. There's a song that I'd like to sing to all of our people. It is to help our people to live. All of our people, it don't matter what kind of Indian you are or what kind of nationality you are. We pray for our people to live. We don't pray to fight against you or to, to battle or, or anything. But I, but I do want our people to live. If this too is a Sundance song, this is for all of our people to live. Sometimes we lose battles, sometimes we win battles, but we have to make sure our trustee is always covering our backs when it comes to protecting our land and our water and our natural resources. So uh, in your position as Assistant Secretary, I hope you would frame what I just wrote, put it on your wall, and read it every day. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Well, this is going to be have to be the last person, Mike. I, I apologize. This is going to have to be the last question here. And speak to you afterwards. I'm happy to speak around. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I just feel the listening to my sister. I feel the pain and just the the heartache. Um, and I know you hear this a lot. But I appreciate you giving us time to just speak our hearts. Um, my people were the Tuscarora, were the Tuscarora. And after the Tuscarora War, when they marched most of our people to New York, 
while people hid out in the swamps of North Carolina. And the stories of our people, of them walking to New York, last time was in the late 1800s. And they came back, and in the early 1900s, the Mohawks walked the sacred fire down to reignite our ceremonies and build our longhouse. At that time, our, our bloodline wasn't important. In fact, there was a fear of our people even acknowledging they were just ignored, which is sad, because that was their bloodline. We lived in a community by, them, by ourselves. We had our longhouse, our songs, our culture, our ceremonies, our chiefs, our clan mothers. We were living as an Indian people. And society thought we were disgusting. They didn't want anything to do with us. And we thought they were disgusting because they married anything. But it was because of our, our, our uniqueness, our bloodline, and the land that we had, we became a target. And our bloodline was sold to another group of people. We were legally terminated by the Lombay in 1956. They wrote a letter in 1940 asking how one group could control the affairs of another group. And you guys told them all it took was a vote. You didn't say who needed to be included in that vote, but just a vote. So they voted. And when you had the hearing, that, that set in place the Lumbee Bill, we were never allowed to testify on whether we wanted to be a part of this or not. And we were pulled over a group called the Lumbee against our will and really against our knowledge. And we're stuck in this. And our history, our bloodline, our names are used in every legislation every year. There's housing that these people get using our history and our bloodline, and we're not able to share it. And I ask you to do the right thing. And I don't care if it is legislative action. It was illegal termination of our people. And our history is being used for money, for gains. And our bloodline has never been for sale. It's still not for sale. We're applying now for federal recognition. We're going to go to the BIA to do that. We meet all seven criteria. We got a grant. But we have this lumpy bill that looms over us. You guys are giving them something that's not theirs. And that's the history of our people. Our land is not for sale. Our bloodline is sacred. There's not a person in here whose bloodline is not sacred to them. We know who our people are. When you guys came down and interviewed us, even the children, my mother, could go back generation after generation after generation and tell you who her people were. There wasn't a lapse in bloodline. And I ask that you do the right thing for Indian country and protect us. Make sure there's not embezzlement going on. Protect us. You have, in North Carolina, my cousin was one of the first, was the first Native American executed. And the lawyer wrote to the Department of Interior and said, you have a responsibility to protect this man. He's not getting a fair trial. And he was executed in a month. And you wrote back and said, just keep us informed of what's going on. And that's not good enough. That's not good enough. And I thank you for your time. I thank you for what you've done. And, and I, I hope what you will do will be even more. When you said I wrote that letter, did I, when did I, did, do you remember the day? I don't remember that letter, I apologize. What letter? So you just said that I wrote a letter back The Department of Interior oh, wrote the letter. The now this was yeah. back in the 30s. Oh, okay. They wrote the letter. But what we ask that you do the right thing for Indian country. And I thank you. I, I thank God for the seven criteria. Because that's kept this group from having federal recognition through my history. But thank you.
Thank you, and I want to thank all of you for, uh, you're all fighting for Indian country and advocating for Indian country, and that's why you're here, and I want to thank you all for, um, for um, giving me a chance to appear before you and for, um, and for um, speaking to me so freely, and um, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks. Sorry, we're, we're running out of time. We're going to we're, we're going to break for lunch. I know that we have some other meetings that are going on right now. Uh, you might can catch the assistant secretary on the side there, sir. Sorry about that. Yeah, close it up. We'll turn it off.